Good morning, everyone. I hope you all are having a great time at the summit. I welcome you all to the session uh, using constraint programming to improve grocery picking efficiency at low gloss. I am Jalpa, moderator for the session. I am a master's student at University of Windsor, researching in the field of AI and NLP. I would now like to introduce uh, our speaker for today, Matthew Silvestre, for joining us today to present the talk. Uh, he is a senior data scientist at Loblaws Digital, and he has also pursued Master of Applied Science at the University of Toronto. Uh, during the talk, if you have any questions, please feel free to post the questions in the chat. And I would now hand over the virtual mic to Matthew. Thank you all. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jalpa, for the introduction. Um, and uh, thanks a lot, everyone, to, to join me today, join us here. Um, I hope you appreciate the keynote. Uh, talk that started us off this morning. And um, let me uh, share my screen here. Um, and can I confirm, Jalpa, that uh, you see my screen? All yes, I can see your screen. Great. Thanks so much. It's a presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, online grocery picking efficiency. Um, before I get started, I just want to give a quick disclaimer. The scope of uh, what I'll be talking about falls more in the realm of operations research than in machine learning per se. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's, uh, I hope it's very interesting uh, for most of you. And um, at the very least, uh, it should be fun and refreshing. So I, I do hope you stick around and that you enjoy this talk. So um, title here, Improving Online Grocery Picking Efficiency. Uh, so I'll be talking about the batching algorithm that we, the data science team, are working on um, at Loblaw Digital. Uh, so for those who don't know us, uh, Loblaw Digital is Loblaw's in-house um, e-commerce startup. It was started in 2012. Uh, we've definitely gained prominence um, during the pandemic uh, due to one of our main products, which is PC Express. So for those who don't know PC Express, uh, PC Express is our online grocery service. Uh, so we offer online groceries both for pickup as well as for delivery. Um, it, it has quite a large uh, range. We have hundreds of stores across Canada. Um, here's a map of our locations in the GTA. So if you are in the GTA, odds are there's a location um, where you could uh, use our service near you. Um, I invite you to do so. It's, it's quite a convenient service, it's nice. Um, so one particularity of a PC Express is that all our PCX orders are fulfilled from stores directly. That means that all the items that are uh, placed in a PCX order that gets picked up from customers are picked up at the store itself, right? So each store will have its own PCX department. And um, within the store, uh, are, we have some of our colleagues, we call them pickers, who are responsible for fulfilling those orders, right? Um, so here's an image of one of our colleagues uh, and one of our customers who has arrived to a store um, for a pickup order. And our colleague had picked up all the items and is now bringing them to our customer. Um, so yes, uh, our colleagues here are responsible for picking all the items and serve them to uh, our customers from the stores. So uh, before diving into uh, the algorithm itself and uh, more technical details, I do need to uh, set the stage a bit more with a high level view of the picking operation. So many of our stores receive over 100 orders each day. Um, so that's a lot of orders, that's a lot of groceries, and you can't pick that all in one shot. You're gonna have to do multiple runs uh, you walk around the store multiple times to pick up uh, all those items, right? Um, we do have specialized equipment to do so. Uh, we use these carts. They're, they're rather large and they hold eight totes. So a tote is, are these black bins. That's one tote here. There are eight of them that fit on each cart. Um, one constraint we do have is that the contents of at most one order uh, can be placed in a, a tote at a given time, right? Um, so that means that a given run, we could pick up to eight totes, uh, eight orders simultaneously. Part of our strategy is to pick by temperature zone. So on a given run, uh, we're either picking items uh, from the ambient zone, uh, from the fridge zone, or from the freezer zone, uh, and not a mix of each. This helps us uh, downstream process um, when we're going to be placing the items and holding them until the customers arrive. Right? Um, finally, another key part of our uh, strategy is well, we tend to pick our most urgent orders first. Uh, what we mean by urgent is orders that need to be staged earlier. Um, why do we use the term staged? 
as opposed to picked up earlier, uh, it's because our service works both for pickup as well as for delivery. So uh, the idea of having the order ready to be to be uh, picked up and left from the store at a given time is encompassed with this stage by time. Um, and so once you're done picking all those items, uh, a picker will go place them uh, in the staging area. So each store has a staging area where these uh, items and orders are, are waiting to be delivered. And so finally they'll get loaded to customers uh, when they arrive or to uh, the vehicle that's used for delivery. Right. Um, so this is most of our uh, equipment. There's one last key uh, and super important piece of equipment that pickers use as they walk around the store, and that is a cell phone that is equipped with the picking app. So um, the cell phone uh, serves multiple purposes. For one, it's used to scan barcodes of items. So we're uh, we ensure that we're picking the right items and place them in the right totes for the correct customer, right? And moreover, it also really guides the pickers as they go through the store. How does it do that? Well, it tells the pickers where to go in the store, right? Once they're at that location, what items to pick, and then which tote to place the picked items in, right? And it just does this over and over for each run. So it'll then tell you where to go next, for instance. Okay, so uh, this process uh, it does, um, this picking up especially, really helps pickers uh, fulfill the orders as they need to. However, there's still one big decision that needs to be made. And that is, on a given run, what do you pick? How do we determine what should be picked on a given run? Right? Um, and that's very difficult. Let me speak a bit more about some motivation for our batching algorithm, which uh, is the main topic of this presentation. So without the batching algorithm, pickers need to choose a set of orders from which they'll attempt to collect all items in the temperature zone they are picking for. That's really difficult. right? Um, should you be picking for five orders? Or maybe that won't fit in your cart. So maybe it's just four orders. Or maybe it's three. Hard to know. But if you do three, maybe you're going to have some empty totes, and that's inefficient. So that's difficult, right? Um, the, uh, the picking app does provide a way to see what the contents of a given order is. But uh, for a picker, it's impossible to have that holistic view required to really say four orders is the optimal thing I should be doing right now. Right? So with the batching algorithm, the pickers will receive a recommendation on what to pick, right? So no more eyeballing. Uh, you receive a recommendation, you know what you should be doing, and you could go ahead and do it. Um, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the algorithm knows the volumetrics of all the items in all the orders. So uh, we, we can ensure that we're doing um, efficient runs where we're picking a good number of items, not too much, not too little, right? And there's another big advantage of using the batching algorithm, and that is that we could pick for subsets of items from a set of orders. We don't need to pick all items from on from an order in one shot, right? Um, when we're doing uh, picking without the batching algorithm, it'd be really, it's it's uh, too difficult to separate an order um, in multiple, uh, between different pickers. There's too much coordination required and that's just a source of error that's undesirable. With a batching algorithm, uh, that's no longer the case and we could be more efficient by splitting orders. Let's. Now talk a bit more of the high-level architecture uh, between the picking app that pickers use and the batching algorithm, which will be uh, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So, um, when we said that uh, a picker will ask for recommendations on a batch to pick, right, a set of items to pick. So uh, they will be communicating through uh, down here inside this through our batching service, um, and the batching service will ping a cache where a set of batches are stored, and then we'll return them quickly to the picking app, right? So very low latency, a picker gets a suggested batch very quickly, which is great. Um, however, uh, that doesn't answer the question of how do we compute the batches that we get cached, right? Well, that starts here at the batching scheduler, which pings the cache builder every 10 minutes. When it gets pinged, the cache builder will go retrieve data, um, enriched order data. So what does that consist of? That consists of all uh, new orders that were added to the system, right? That then includes uh, latest events about what items have been picked recently, right? Then we're gonna enrich it with data, uh, like volumetrics, weights for all the items, and as well as where they are located in the store. And that information is all passed to the batching algorithm. The batching algorithm, 
will compute batches from all the items and orders that are sent to it, return them to the cache builder, which will then populate the cache. So at a very high level, uh, this will be the, the architecture in which the batching algorithm uh, operates, right? And uh, the key takeaway from, from this slide is that uh, we will be recomputing new batches every 10 minutes, right? As the cache builder gets triggered. So what are the inputs and outputs of this batching algorithm? Well, the, the algorithm receives a request. In the request, uh, we have a store ID. So that specifies the store at which uh, the batch needs to be computed, right? As well as a list of orders. For each order, um, we have an order ID. that is staged by time, right? When the order needs to be staged and ready to be picked up or taken away for delivery. Um, as well as a set of items that are in the order, right? So each item will have an ID, a weight, a height, a width, a depth, a zone. So it refers to the temperature zone, either ambient, fridge, or freezer, as well as the location within the store. On the flip side, the algorithm needs to uh, return a list of batches. And for each batch, we need to specify the zone, uh, ambient, fridge, or freezer, right? The priority of that batch, um, which determines the order in which the, caches are uh, the batches are returned from the cache, um, as well as a set of totes. So, uh, for each batch, there could be up to eight totes. Each tote is associated to an order. And finally, most importantly, a pick route, right? So that specifies the, the sequence in which different locations should be uh, visited, as well as a set of items that need to be picked up at that location, and then the associated tote in which the item needs to be placed in. So let's go a bit more in depth about the objective of the batching algorithm, right? What we're trying to do here is maximize UPH. So what does UPH stand for? It's units per hour, right? So um, the more units you pick per hour, the more efficient we are being, um, the more we're reducing our cost to serve per order. Uh, cost to serve would be the, the fraction of the cost of an online order, which uh, comes from labor costs, right? Um, so as our operation scales, it's important for us to keep that number down. Um, so to maximize UPH, uh, there are two key things we want to do. One is to maximize UPR, so that's the number of units per run, right, per batch. Um, and then the second thing we want to do is we want to minimize the time taken to complete each run, right? So you can you can think of the UPH as, as a fraction between number of units you pick divided by how much time it took you to pick them, right? Um, to do so, we have two main strategies. First, we want to fill up our totes as much as possible, right? So that relates to maximizing UPR. And then the second thing we want to do uh, to minimize the time taken to complete each run, is we want to group items that are in a similar location in the store in the same batch. What does this do? This means that the amount of walking that is required to go pick up all the items is reduced. If less walking is required, uh, less time will be taken to pick up the items in that batch. And so we're going to be increasing UPH. So we've already alluded to some constraints. Um, let's uh, look at them a bit more in depth here. Right, so each tote has a volume and a weight limit, right? So you cannot exceed those uh, for safety reasons, but also there are physical constraints. And so you can't fit an arbitrary number of items in a given tote, right? Um, for each run, we want items from a single temperature zone, which we mentioned earlier. For each tote, we want contents, uh, the contents of each tote come from a single order, right? We mentioned this earlier as well. Uh, eight totes per batch. So that relates to uh, the carts that we use, which could hold up to eight totes. Uh, we mentioned earlier that we want to prioritize picking items from orders with earlier stage by times. Um, so this is to ensure that all their cust our customers receive their orders on time as they expect and to protect the customer's experience. Um, and finally, two last uh, constraints. The algorithm needs to have a reasonable runtime. Uh, we need to be computing this fairly quickly. And um, more importantly, our approach needs to be generic, has to be applicable to all stores, right? So we have hundreds of stores across the country. We don't want a solution that's tailored to a single store. We need something that could be used at all stores. So what are the high level logical steps of our algorithm? Well, first, um, we create totes. What does that mean? That means assigning each item that needs to be batched to a tote. Once we have our totes, we'll create batches. So that means grouping totes into batches, right? Groups of eight batches. 
uh, eight toads per batch. And finally, uh, we want to define pick sequence. So that means optimizing the sequence in which to pick the items that are in a batch. Let's start with how we create toads. So what are the relevant constraints here? Uh, we said that we want to put a single order and a single temperature zone in a given tote, right? And moreover, a tote's content cannot exceed the tote or its volume or weight capacity, right? There's some limits. Uh, here's an image of a tote. It's a simple bin. Um, I'm sure you can imagine what it looks like and feels like. Um, so how are we going to tote items? How are we going to assign them to totes? Well, we could apply a very simple uh, sequence of steps, right? And then that we repeat for each ordered end zone. So first, uh, we could place these items in some sequence, some arbitrary sequence for now, right? And then we'll take the first item in that sequence and place it in the first tote. Next, we'll look at the second item in the sequence and we'll see, hey, does it fit in the first tote along with the first item? If it does, great, we'll place it in that same tote. If it does not, well, we'll start a new tote with that item. And we'll repeat that over and over until we're at the end of our sequence and all our items have been assigned to a tote. Super simple. Key question though is, what is the sequence? How can we define the sequence, right? Let's look at um, a, a very generic or simplified store layout here, right? So we can think of this rectangle as a overhead view of a store, right? Um, there are some aisles in the store, so there are barriers here in dark gray. And then the items, that need to be toted for a given order and zone will be scattered, the, these black dots. Okay, so um, in practice, we actually don't have clean data for where the barriers are, right? Where you can't walk through. So in practice, we're actually looking at an image that looks more like this. Uh, this is a bit more challenging because some items, they might seem really close together, but we can't just walk from one to the other. We have to walk around. Luckily, uh, we could use the default static pick path. So what is uh, the default static pick path? Well, basically, um, when we set up a store to receive uh, PC Express orders, uh, we uh, create a sequence, a snake path, that goes through all the store um, and stops by all locations where there might be items that need to be picked up. Right. So we can leverage this in our solution. It exists at all stores. and key thing here is it induces a sequence in the items that need to be picked, right? And that's the sequence we could use for a simple logic. And if we do so, uh, we start at the bottom here. Here's our first item we place in the first tote. Here's our second item. It fits in the first tote, so we'll do so. Still fits, still fits, so on and so forth. This one also still fits. This in here does not fit in our first tote. So we start a second tote and we continue with our second tote up until here. Now, this item here did not fit in our second tote, so we start a third tote, and we continue down until we toted all the items. So for this order and zone, we would have had three different totes, and uh, they're color-coded as described here. Some of you may be asking, why don't we use bin packing? Right. So for those who don't know what bin packing is, uh, it's a classic uh, problem. Uh, the idea is, um, if I have a set of items that need to be packed in bins, um, how, what's the minimum number of bins I could use to pack all the items, right? So that's a well-known uh, optimization formulation that could be used to solve this. Well, um, in practice, it provides a very underwhelming gain, right? Um, so it's a, a minimal reduction in the number of totes that are actually required. Um, and why is this? The vast majority of orders require two totes or less per temperature zone, right? So if you need uh, one tote, you can't, you need one tote, you, you won't be able to get away with zero totes. If you need two totes, based on our simple logic, uh, there's no way that a single tote could have been sufficient, right? So it's only if you need more than two totes that it's possible that rearranging things around, you would be able to get away with fewer totes. Um, and that doesn't happen often at all. So that's great. We are, uh, we've covered uh, how we're gonna create totes. Um, next is grouping these totes into batches. So where are the objectives and constraints here? Well, we wanna group totes that are located in a similar area of the store together, right? Why so? That will reduce the walking distance required to pick all the items in a given batch, um, which reduces the time taken to complete that run, and which will ultimately increase UPH, our KPI. Right? While doing so, we also have to make sure that we're assigning totes that have earlier stage by times to higher priority batches. Right? 
And why is this? We want to make sure that we pick up everything that needs to be picked up on time, right? Um, that's very important. Now, you may observe that uh, without the second constraint here, we'd have a larger pool of totes that can be grouped together, which would enable us to better adjust one, right? Which is, and, and, and one is where we're increasing UPH, right? So for now, let's simplify the problem. Let's neglect the fact that totes have different stage write times, and let's just focus on how we could group totes that are locally in the similar area of the store together. And let's look back at our previous example um, where we had an order, uh, an order in zone that we uh, took all the items from and assigned them into totes, right? So we had done them like this, and we had this color coding scheme where all in red, we have all items in tote one, in green, we have items in tote two, and in yellow, we have items in tote three. Now, all locations have a pick location index that is induced by the default static pick path. So what do we mean by that? Well, we had this default static pick path here, and there are different locations that it passes by along the way. And it starts at this location here, which will have pick location index one. Then it goes to the location with index two, three, four, five, blah, 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 and it goes all the way to the end of the store, right? Now, uh, we can use this to describe um, where a tote is in the store, right? So each tote will have a range of pick location indices. So for instance, the first tote here in red has a range of pick location indices from two to 25. The second one has a range from 26 to 53. The third one from 55 to 80. And if we're just focusing on where a tote is within the store, we don't actually have to look at the items. We could really just look at the range of pick location indices that captures uh, where, a store, where a tote is within the store, assuming that we'll be following the default static pick path as we uh, go around to pick the items. So uh, up until here, we're focusing on items from a single order and zone. Here, let's assume we have multiple orders, right? Ultimately, we're gonna be grouping totes together from different orders. And uh, for simplicity, I'm just illustrating five different totes, and I'm showing the pick location index range of each tote, right? And if we look a bit more closely, we see that totes A and B are very much in the same area of the store, right? Uh, totes C and D as well. In fact, if you are going to be following the default side pick path uh, to pick all items in totes C, you will inevitably be walking by all of the items that need to be placed in tote D, right? So you might as well be uh, picking tote D at the same time as you're being picking tote C, right? So uh, yeah, to summarize those observations, totes A and B are very close together. C, D, and E as well are close together. Maybe E a little farther than C, but they're still close in the same area of the store. Um, so we could see that by looking at, at this uh, this graph here, right? The, this this illustration. However, we could look at this uh, more simply by simply plotting uh, the pick location index on a single axis, and then the range of pick location indices of each tote along that axis, right? And so what we see here is that totes A and B are in the same area. What I mean by that is there's a lot of overlap in their pick location index range, right? Uh, same for C and D, and E as well has some overlap with C. So to reiterate, the key observation here is that grouping totes together efficiently implies grouping totes that have a lot of overlap in their range of pick location indices. That's the key idea that we'll be doing and exploiting when we're going to be grouping totes together. So let's look at this, uh, let's play a little game here, right? Uh, so let's assume that we have eight totes, A through H, right? They all have the same stage by time. And for clarity and for simplicity, let's assume that there are only four totes per batch rather than eight, right? In this case, which totes should we be grouping together? Well, you may notice that uh, the pick location index range of totes A, D, E, and F uh, are all on the lower end of the pick location index spectrum, right? Or we could call on the left side of the store for simplicity. So totes A, D, E, and F all seem to be on the left side of the store. On the other hand, tote B, G, and H are more on the right side of the store. And tote C, it really, it's, it's throughout the store, right? Um, so maybe we could group totes A, D, E, and F together. We're only gonna be walking through one side of the store and that would leave us with B, C, G, and H together. And unfortunately, you have to walk through the whole store. Uh, but that's inve inevitable that we'll end up with one batch that requires walking through the whole store because tote C 
requires walking through the whole store, right? Um, and why is this assignment good? What's the, how can we quantify this, right? Justify this decision? Well, what we could do is we could look at the maximum pick location index and the minimum pick location index of each batch, right? So what we mean by that is uh, for tote one in red here, the max pick location index is, is the extremity of tote D, right? The minimum would be the opposite extremity of tote A. Um, similarly, we have the min and the max for tote two right, in blue. And we're minimizing the sum of the max minus the min or the range of the pick location index in each batch. So to illustrate this further, uh, this would be the range of pick location indices of tote one. This would be the range of pick location indices of tote two, right? And what we're doing is that we're taking the sum of the two and we get a length like this, right? That's proportional to the cost, right? So um, a better uh, assignment of totes two batches would be one that reduces the length of this line down here. Okay, so our objective was to minimize the sum of pick location index ranges of each batch, right? So K here iterates over the batches. TK is a set of pick location indices in batch K. And of course, there are some constraints, right? Uh, each tote needs to be assigned to a single batch, uh, not zero, not two batches, just one, right? And moreover, uh, we need to have eight totes per batch, right? Um, and as a side note, uh, the number of batches that are required is determined by the number of totes that need to be batched, right? So there's no mystery there. Um, now you may wonder, okay, well, can we just brute force this, consider all possible combination of totes into batches and then see which one does the best uh, according to this objective function? Not quite. Why so? With eight totes, um, well, we only have one possible batch, so that's very simple. There's, you just take that, those eight totes, create one batch, and you're done. However, with 16 totes, that's two batches, you already have thousands of possibilities. If you have 24 totes, so three batches, you're in the billions of possibilities. And basically, this, uh, this graph here, is, uh, is, is not linear, right? it's, it's exponentially growing. And so, um, yeah, as we increase the number of totes that we have, this problem becomes massive and massive, and we need some way of optimizing how we're gonna be assigning totes into batches uh, so that this problem becomes feasible and tractable and solvable in a short amount of time. So again, here's our objective function. Uh, we had some constraints, right? The number of totes per batch, and each tote needs to be assigned. We'll get back to them soon. And let's define x. So I'll be a binary matrix of size, number of totes by number of batches, right? And so um, we'll have number of totes here, number of batches here, and then we'll define x i j uh, such that it's where, where i where is associated to a tote and a j, it will be a column, will be associated to a batch, right? And we'll say x i j is equal to one if tote i is assigned to batch j, and zero otherwise. So uh, in this example here, x24 is one, which means that tote two is assigned to batch four, right? And uh, as a constraint, we can imagine that x2 and anything other than four need to be equal to zero because each tote needs to be assigned to at most one batch, right? So right away, we've already identified one of our constraints. The sum of each row of x needs to be equal to one. And then the other constraint that we were talking about was that we need to have eight totes per batch, right? So in other words, the sum of each column needs to be equal to eight. Um, so here we are, here are our constraints. Um, that's great, uh, we have a solution, right? Um, not quite, right? Because we're neglecting some constraints. Which constraints were they? That we have to assign totes that have earlier stage by times to higher priority batches. So uh, now, um, Unfortunately, uh, that means that we'll have a couple additional constraints that are required. So for now, moving forward, we'll no longer neglect those constraints. And uh, let's see what we could do. So let's go back to this familiar game, right? Where we're looking at the range of pick location indices here. And now we're looking at 12 totes, uh, not just eight. And still, let's assume that there are only four totes per batch. Same question as before, which totes should be grouped together? Also, I'll quickly uh, give you an idea of what we should be doing. 
we look at A, E, H, and J. They're all on the left side of the store. Uh, similarly, B, C, F, and L are all more or less on the right side of the store. Then we have four totes of G, G, I, and K, which are more or less in the middle of the store. So let's group them together, right? Like this. We said we wouldn't assume that all the totes have the same stage by time. So instead, let's assume that totes A, B, C, and D need to be staged by 4 p.m. today. So that's what, that's uh, five, and ha uh, five and a half hours from now, roughly, right? Um, e, F, G, and H will need to be batched or picked, staged um, for uh, an hour later at 5 p.m. Um, totes I and J will need to be staged by 7 p.m. and totes K and L at 8 p.m. So now, same question as before, which totes should be grouped together? Well, if we really want to make sure that we pick up higher priority batches, higher priority totes first, we only have one possibility, right? Uh, we'll pick up the four totes that need to be staged at 4 p.m. first, then we'll pick up the four totes that need to be staged at 5 p.m., and then we'll pick up the four totes that need to be staged last. Single possibility. And if we look, we're not doing a particularly efficient job, right? Uh, the first tote will, the first batch will require walking through the entire store. Same story for the second batch and same story for the third batch, which is much worse than this assignment where we had one batch on the left side of the store, one in the middle of the store, and one only on the right of the store. How can we relax the priority constraints without eliminating it, right? Um, well, what we're looking at is at quantifying to what extent the priority constraint can be violated. And we're doing so with two different configurations, the batch leeway and the hour leeway. So uh, what are these? Well, the batch leeway states that a batch of priority I can have totes of stage by time T, provided that all totes of stage by time S less than T, so all totes that need to be staged earlier, are in batches of priority I plus batch leeway. That's our configuration. The hour leeway states that batch of priority I cannot have totes of stage by time T larger than S plus hour leeway, so totes very much in the future, unless all totes of stage by time R less or equal to S are in batches of lower priority, priority less or equal to I. Okay. This might sound a bit difficult for now. We'll go back to examples to see how these work. First key observation, if the batch leeway or the hour leeway is zero, then we must perfectly respect the chronological order um, of the totes and how we batch them, right? And uh, more uh, qualitatively, the larger our leeway values are, the more we allow totes, uh, the more we allow grouping totes uh, in uh, ways that come at the expense of respecting the chronological prioritization of the batch totes. So yeah, this might sound a bit more tricky now. Let's look at examples. So uh, the exact same example as before, 12 totes, four totes per batch. Here are the stage by time. So four of them need to be staged at 4 p.m. Four of them need to be staged at 5 p.m., two of them at 7 p.m., and two of them at 8 p.m., right? And now let's assume that the batch leeway as well as the hourly weight is equal to zero. Which totes should be grouped together? So. Uh, if the batch leeway or the hour leeway was equal to zero, we said we had to fully respect the chronological prioritization of totes. And so that leaves us with one possible solution, right? The four totes at 4 p.m. need to be picked first. The four totes at 5 p.m. need to be picked second. And then the last remaining four totes that have later stage by times will be picked third, right? That's it. So not a very efficient solution for each batch. We need to walk through the entire store. What if the batch leeway is equal to one and the hourly leeway is equal to one? Well, the batch leeway equal to one implies that we could pick totes with a later stage by time that do not respect that priority, so long as everything that needed to be picked earlier is picked within one batch, right? And the hourly way tells us that um, we could pick uh, totes that are not as pressing, do not are not as urgent, provided that their stage by time is at most one hour later than the one that we're delaying, than the total that we're delaying, right? So what does that tell us? Uh, if we look at these stage by times here, first thing we note is that the last four totes all need to be staged two hours after the first eight totes, at least two hours after the first eight totes, right? Now our hourly way is only one. So that means that we cannot prioritize picking any of these four totes 
before any of these eight totes. So right away, that tells us that these last four totes will constitute our last, last batch. Right? Now, amongst the other remaining totes, right, uh, some of them will be assigned to batch of priority one, some of them will be assigned to batch of priority two. Now, the difference in their priority is equal to one, um, and that coincides with our batch leeway. So the batch leeway will not impose any constraints on how these totes will be um, batched, right? These eight totes here. Moreover, um, the hourly way is also equal to one. And now the difference, maximum difference in stage by times of these different totes is one as well. So the hourly way will also not impose any constraints. So to reiterate, that means our last four totes will be in batch of priority three, and we could combine the first eight totes however we want to minimize walking distance. And that'll give us something like this, right? So uh, we have one inefficient batch of priority three, which implies walking through the whole store. Then we have one batch of priority, um, this one here will actually be priority two, which uh, involves just walking on the left side of the store, whereas we have one batch which involves only walking on the right side of the store. So this is more efficient than our solution where we had leeways equal to zero, where each batch implied walking through the entire store. Let's play the same game with um, batch leeway and hour leeway equal to two. Um, now, one uh, first observation is that the last two totes only uh, have a stage by time that is three hours later than the totes um, E, F, G, and H. So these two will have to be in batch of priority three because hourly way is two and the difference between 8 p.m. and 5 p.m. is only three, is three, which is larger than two, right? Uh, on the other hand, the batch leeway, which is equal to two, means that um, we could be picking uh, an item so long as within two batches, uh, all the totes that need to be picked earlier are picked. Uh, and since we only have three totes, uh, three batches, right? Um, batch leeway of two means that we do not have any constraint on how we're gonna be uh, uh, picking prioritizing totes uh, according to the batch leeway. So I'll skip a few details here and uh, simply uh, argue that this is one uh, assignment that we could do with these configurations. And again, we're being more efficient than when we had batch leeway equal to one and hourly leeway equal to one uh, because we have one tote, one batch that's on the left side of the store, one batch that's on the right side of the store, and a second batch that's also on the right side of the store. Finally, uh, if we had batch leeway equal to two and hourly leeway equal to four, um, we said before that batch leeway equal to two means that given that there are only three totes, uh, three batches, uh, this does not impose any constraints. Hour leeway equal to four does not impose any constraints either because the maximum stage by time of all remaining totes is 8 p.m. The minimum is 4 p.m. Difference is only four hours, which is equal to our hour leeway. So now we could really uh, batch however we want, neglecting the stage by times. And we'll have the solution we illustrated earlier where there's one batch on the left side of the store, one batch in the middle of the store, and one batch on the right of the store. Now, how do we implement these in practice, these leeways in practice, right? Well, um, I'll spare some details, but the main idea here is that um, we could do so by having some pairwise uh, constraints, right? So one scalar compared to another scalar, and the scalars that we'll be comparing in these constraints are the max stage by time of a batch, and the min stage by time of another batch, right? Now, these can be captured uh, through, uh, they can be defined easily, right? And um, then ultimately, these whole, uh, all these constraints could be very uh, easily implemented in practice, uh, either using constraint programming or linear programming mixed into a linear programming, that is, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm sparing the details, but the idea here is that it's implementable in a pretty straightforward manner in practice. So this is practical and convenient for us. On a more business side, um, how do we choose the leeways, right? So what are the trade-offs here? Well, with larger leeways, we could do a better reduction in walking distance, so we could be more efficient and increase UPH more. However, with larger leeways, we're also putting stores at a higher risk of staging orders after their stage by time, right? And that's particularly bad if we um, actually are late in staging order and a customer picks comes to the store and then their items are not ready. That That's to be avoided at all costs, right? So how do we navigate this trade-off? Well, what we could do is we could set the leeways dynamically. And we do so as a function of a couple different things. One will be the 
earliest stage by time of the remaining orders minus the current time, right? So if uh, we're picking for items much later in the day uh, and everything early in the day has been picked already, well, then we could be a bit more flexible in how we pick. Okay. Uh, another thing we might want to consider is the number of totes that remain to be picked, right? And finally, the number of different pickers that we have in our PC Express department. So there we are. We've talked about creating totes. We've talked about uh, grouping those totes into batches. Finally, um, how do we define how we should be going through the store and picking all the uh, items that go into a given batch? That's something that we haven't actually implemented yet. Um, we're still using the default static pick path, but it is uh, one of our next steps. So as I just mentioned, one of our next steps is routing. Uh, so routing things dynamically, not relying on the, dynamic, uh, the static pick path. Another uh, next step is to use subtotes. And uh, what I mean by that is having more than one order per tote. Uh, this will be beneficial in many ways. For one, um, we could ensure better utilization of the space of a tote. And secondly, we could also do a better job at concentrating um, items in a given batch in a small area of the store. Right? So that'll really help us with UPH, units per hour, our, key, our KPI. And finally, another next step is handling regular shaped items. So um, all the items, are they're not liquids, right? They, they, they can't just occupy any space that they're assigned to. They do have shapes that we have to respect and cannot squeeze things around. So uh, that's another uh, key area that we're looking at. So with that, that's my presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, hope you appreciate it. And I'm very happy to take questions. Hi, um, am I audible? Uh, yeah, that was a wonderful presentation, Matthew. Uh, so we definitely have some uh, audience questions, which I'd like ask you in the order that we got. So the first question was uh, by Kulkarni uh, that uh, what in the architecture that you showed in your slides, uh, at what point uh, do you factor in inventory and stock levels in the aisles? OK, very good question. So um, that, that's really tricky because uh, it's very difficult for us to track inventory precisely and perfectly. Um, and it's something we're working on. How can we uh, determine whether or not we should be picking a given item at a given time? All right, if it's out of stock, we don't want to assume that it's going it should be picked because that'll take up space um, and that'll be inefficient because that space won't be used. Um, so uh, it would be in the architecture if I show you earlier. You can still see my screen, eh? Yes, we can see a screen. Perfect. OK, well, here we are. So um, that will happen here. We'll see what events are happening in the store. And then uh, according to this, we'll get information on the items. And we only want to pass items that can be picked at a given time. OK, I see. Um, so I hope that uh, could, uh, that answers the question for Kulkarni. Uh, moving on to the next question by Shrikant. Uh, are you using a, a SQL or a NoSQL for storing data uh, as it looks like a key value store? Um, yeah, I, I don't want to go into too much depth on that, uh, but we, we do, for the most part, use SQL um, for for our information here. Okay, yeah, that's understandable. Uh, and there was another question as well uh, from Srikant. What happens when there's delay in their order and they cancel the order? Does your program adjust to such events? Yeah. So uh, let's first uh, let's let's first address the canceling an order or modification of an order, right? Um, so our order management system will uh, be aware of that and then uh, publish events. And uh, every 10 minutes, we get the latest events, right? So. Um, within a short amount of time, we're able to adapt and modify our cache accordingly. Yeah, I think there was another question of what happens if uh, we are late or we are delayed? I'm, I'm not sure if I understood that. Uh, yeah, uh, so if there's a uh, delay or like if the order is canceled, uh, how does uh, it adjust to such orders? So for an existing order, if there's any modification or delay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so for, yeah, for, for how they're canceled, uh, they're handled. Uh, I explained that if an order is delayed, so assume that things are really not going well in the store and we're delayed in how we pick. Well, first, we'd put our leeways down to zero. Uh, second, ideally, we'd be able to um, get reinforcements to more colleagues to, to help pick the remaining items and so that we uh, get back on track as soon as possible. Okay. 
Sounds good. Uh, so moving on to the next question, um, it's by Rajiv. Are we assuming that all items for an order are continuous? Example, is it possible for, for an order item to have an index zero and another item to have an index at 80? Uh, yeah, so the index along the pick location uh, sequence uh, is just a standard. So it starts at zero and it goes upwards from there. Yeah. Um, if I'm not wrong, I saw that you were connecting it with the aisles and how it moves from there. So uh, maybe that's the connection between the um, order items with having to go with the aisles. Yeah. There's another question. Um, uh, what programming languages or frameworks uh, did you use to in implement the constraint programming? Yeah. Okay. So you could use many different types of um many different languages will offer this. Uh, one that's nice and convenient open sourced is OR Tools uh, by Google. Um, if, if you're looking to get started with it, it's definitely convenient. They have a lot of uh, tutorials and examples of how to use it. So um, yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, that's nice. Um, also, uh, we have one from Shreyas. Uh, he thanks for a detailed explanation and presentation. And uh, the question is, in approximate terms, how much time has been saved or the number of orders fulfilled uh, using this approach? Yeah, uh, good question. So I can't speak in, in the exact terms, uh, but there is a meaningful lift that we're observing, uh, which is good. And, um, and, we're, and we're still iterating on, on their algorithm and uh, improving it. So um, yeah, it, it's it's useful for us and uh, that's what we want. Uh, okay. And uh, one question from Rajiv again. Um, once you choose the constraint model of computation, uh, did it make certain decisions difficult to implement in that style? Uh, or to put it in other words, what are your experiences of constraint programming? Um, actually, you know, I can read the questions here. I'm just noticing that. Uh, Did you want yeah, to? So, so, yeah, so, yeah, I, 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 reading the question here. Thanks. Um, okay. So the question about uh, choosing the constraints. Uh, I guess part of the idea here is that we want to define our constraints um, in a convenient way to program them, right? Uh, and something that's also tractable and, and efficient to, to compute. So, um, so, the, the I guess that was already accounted for uh, how we'd be implementing them when we defined um, our constraints in the first place. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the final one is um, the tools. Uh, so it was OR tools, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let me just, yeah, there you go. Well, thank you. <laughs> you yeah. beat me to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, seems like those other questions uh, that we have got here. Uh, thank you so much again, Matthew, for your wonderful presentation and talk. And I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us. Uh, I also wanted to remind the audience that there are different booths that they can go check. And there's also a replay option available uh, just to uh, view if you've missed any talks. Thank you, Shreyas. Uh, do have a very great good day, all. Thanks, Lost Chapla. And thank you for everyone for uh, your attention.